Thank you for joining us, everybody. Welcome uh, to our Friday afternoon talk. I'm Tim Donay. I'm a faculty member here and uh, also uh, the uh, faculty cluster lead for the Conflict and Security Research Cluster. Um, so my pleasure to invite uh, or to welcome you here today and to welcome uh, an old an old colleague, uh, Tom Delianis, whose name I've been pronouncing wrong, as I learned yesterday for about 10 years. Um, but Tom and I have worked together in global studies at Laurier for, uh, for, for many years, teaching peace and conflict courses. So delighted to have uh, to Tom, Tom here today to talk about uh, uh, Peru conflict, uh, security. We had an all-day workshop here yesterday, so in some ways it's a, it's a continuation of the conversation we had about conflict, peace, and security. Yeah. Um, let me just briefly uh, give you Tom's uh, pertinent details before I hand the floor over to him. Tom has a, a PhD in political science uh, from the University of Toronto and was in fact his uh, his PhD in fact won a international award from the Hans Gunther Brauch Foundation for Peace and Ecology in the Anthropocene uh, just 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 recently I believe um, Tom also has an MA in uh, international relations history from the University of Toronto and a BA in history of political studies from the University of Guelph um, and has also, because Tom and I are also looking at doing a field course in Costa Rica next spring, uh, Tom also taught as a, as a visiting resident, resident professor. as a resident Bandit. professor at the University for Peace in, in Costa Rica uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, 2005. 2005, 2007. So Tom's research obviously focuses on, uh, on the intersection of intersections of conflict and uh, the environment with a particular emphasis on, uh, on Latin America. So we have 90 minutes. Uh, Tom's going to speak for about half that, and then uh, we'll take Q&A. Let me just welcome those who are joining us uh, over Zoom. Uh, Morel and I will uh, co-moderate questions uh, once we get to the, to the Q&A period. But uh, with, that, with that, Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you for those of you online. I appreciate your uh, taking part today. Uh, this work is uh, evolved out of my dissertation, and it's part of a book that I hope to have published in 2025 uh, with Springer uh, of the same title. Uh, and so uh, I welcome all comments and feedback and criticisms and questions. Um, so my presentation today is going to be divided into three sections. The first section is going to explain my motivation uh, for going to Peru to examine whether human pressure on resources and local environments help to cause rural violence and help to cause the shiny path insurgency. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why I changed direction when I went to do my field work and instead focused on a puzzle about why one community in the district that I was studying, the community of Kispiakta, suffered much more in the uh, dirty war, the civil war, and counterinsurgency um, against the Peruvian government. In the second section, I want to explain how uh, local field work and the development of a livelihood framework helped me make sense of supply, demand, and distributional changes in resources like cultivated land, pasture land, and water, and how that impacted livelihoods in the district of Chusci, the main focus of my research. And I outlined my empirical findings and theoretical findings in the search third section of the presentation. And I argue that winners and losers in a centuries-long struggle for land in the district, a conflict that was aggravated by human pressure on local environments, led the community of Kispiakta to be labeled as a shining path stronghold by uh, people in neighboring communities. And this led to what I call score settling by counterinsurgency when Peru's army entered into the district to do to conduct counterinsurgency operations in 1983, members of rival communities that had lost out in the centuries long conflict over resources uh, claimed that Kispiakta was a shining path insurgency stronghold. And that led to uh, disproportionate military massacres, uh, disappearances and repression falling on the community of Kispiakta. An outcome of the consequences, I would argue, over the decades of conflict over limited resources in this area. 
So the theoretical implications of this study help us to understand how human pressure can impact the nature of violence in war in this particular case, rather than uh, helping us understand conflict onset, which is a big debate in the field. And I would argue that you can't understand why violence happened the way it did and to who it did without understanding the long particular uh, history of human pressure on local resources and the competition that took place over resource endowments in the district. Now, uh, my motivation for this project uh, began out of uh, debates about qualitative research around environment conflict linkages uh, that really took off in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, critics of that research questioned the credibility of findings uh, of that work on the basis of a variety of different critiques. Research design, for example, how the independent variable was characterized, um, the role of population growth in the analysis. They questioned the case studies. They questioned the causal weighting that was done in that work. Uh, many scholars uh, in the early 2000s called for uh, detailed field work to be done where you went out in the field and spent a good deal of time rather than doing desk studies to try to explore some of the debates. Um, and that was really the basis for my work and it really um, helped to focus what I was doing. And I chose Peru as my particular uh, research because Peru appeared to be what, would, what you could call an important case or a most likely case in the social science methodology. Uh, Peru with a very large population of impoverished small scale farmers dependent largely upon local resources seemed to look like a very good place where you could explore the impacts of human pressure on the environment. And Peru also suffered through a very terrible civil war between 1980 and 1994, when the Shining Path guerrilla group attempted to overthrow the Peruvian government and install a radical Maoist uh, government. And the insurgency and the counterinsurgency operations of the per Peruvian government, which were very brutal, uh, ended up killing at least 70,000 people uh, in that war. Some scholars like political scientist Cynthia McClintock have controversially argued that the Shining Path insurgency was a peasant rebellion stimulated by a subsistence crisis in the late 1970s, just before the Civil War broke out in 1980. So my hope in choosing Peru was that this case study could tell us something important about existing research on environmental conflict and speak to some of the debates uh, that were happening at that time and also help us to learn a little bit more about the debates that are currently happening about the impact of climate change. Debates over uh, environmental change conflict linkages haven't gone away uh, since the early 2000s. In fact, they've resurfaced in many of the same forms uh, since about 2005, six, seven around debates between climate change linkages and violent conflict. In fact, we've seen uh, very vigorous academic scholarly debates about whether or not climate change helped cause the Syrian civil war. Um, and some of the exact same debates that were happening in the early 2000s are being repeated in the debates about whether climate change had a role in Syria's civil war. Debates about the significance, uh, causal significance of climate change or environmental change the, um, the importance of livelihood immiseration in the process, questions about whether or not state capacity deficiencies were more important for, uh, or political economic choices were more important for the cause of the conflict, et cetera. So I think my case speaks to a lot of these contemporary debates as well. Now, uh, let me just set the scene first about uh, the community and the district that I was uh, doing research in. The district of Chuschi, which was my primary focus, is located in Peru's south central Andes uh, in a region called Ayacucho. The regions are analogous to our provinces and the district is ana analogous to our municipalities. Um, the district is located in a very isolated area of steep high mountains. To the south, you can see um, the Rio Pampas River Valley, uh, in the south of the district, I don't know if I can, yeah, I can't actually show it here, it runs all along the south of the district. Um, and it's about 2,700 meters at, in the southern part of the district. 
Um, cultivated agriculture on steep slopes can be found in these lower elevation areas of the district. Um, they kind of show up a little bit green on this image. You can see the green areas that would be cultivated agriculture mostly. Mountains fill the center of the district uh, and an it's an area of high altitude livestock production uh, rising to well over 4,000 meters uh, with some areas rising to over 5,000 meters in the extreme northeast of the district. And in the northwest of the district up uh, in these areas up here, you have uh, another uh, river valley watershed called the Rio Cachi watershed. And that area is a mix of livestock and, and small scale agriculture as well. Now the district of Chuschi has long been dominated by the town of Chuschi. Um, so here's the town of Chuschi right there. Um, and it sits in uh, this river valley of the same name uh, down in that area of green where there's a little spike coming up. Uh, the peasant community of Chuschi shares uh, historical and cultural affinity, affinity with many of the um, communities to the west. Uh, unfortunately, my pointer doesn't work on this. So over here, many of these communities share cultural affinity with the community of Kispiak. The next door, right across a small little creek, is the community of Kispiakta. And the community of Kispiakta has been a rival to the community of Chuschi since actually before Spanish colonialism, since the uh, communities were actually moved to this area by the Incas following the Wari Wars. Um, and Kispiakta has several associated hamlets that share uh, cultural affinity with it, uh, located throughout the higher altitude zones of the district. Now, um, the historical and contemporary competition and conflict between these two communities is really the main focus of my study in Peru. Now, the district was isolated from most markets, and as peasants have historically been heavily reliant on uh, subsistence or semi-subsistence agriculture and livestock production for the bulk of their livelihood needs, it's a very remote district. It's about five or six uh, hours by car or bus from the capital city, uh, Wamanga. Um, and uh, most people uh, rely on a mix of animal husbandry and small-scale agriculture to survive with some small-scale commodity production. That's historically been the dominant way that people have made a living in this community. Um, ah, thank you. So there you can see the community of Kispiakta on the right and the community of Chuschi on the right, left. They're literally just um, isolated or separated by a small little creek. Uh, and you can see some high altitude grazing zones in Kispiakta as well. Now the district is famous in Peru because it's actually the location of where the first armed actions by the Shining Path took place in 1980 when the Shining Path burned the ballot boxes for the 1980 presidential election. Uh, in the town square in Chuschi. Um, the district's poor peasant uh, communities initially seemed to tolerate or at least be open to the presence of Shining Past militants in the communities. Um, and the community of Kispiakta next door, which was always the poorest uh, community in the district historically, uh, was, is, and was, it still is in today, uh, today in Peru, if you ask Peruvians, they would probably tell you, because that's the impression that they've been given by media and scholars, that it was a community that had far more Shining Pass supporters than anybody else in the name, in the area. And that community, the community of Kispiyakta, suffered disproportionately more uh, deaths and, and de disappearances in the bloody first years of the Civil War, especially after the government, proving government's counterinsurgency campaign began in the area in 1983. And you can see that in the chart with disproportionate deaths showing uh, from two different studies uh, between Kispiakta in blue and Chuschi in red. Now, at first, it seemed to me this make a good deal of sense to try to examine human pressure on uh, and competition for land resources uh, in the plus, in the event that there was a kind of livelihood crisis in that area in the 1970s, and how that might have actually impacted the the outbreak of the Shining Path insurgency, particularly by looking at Kispiakta, because they seem to be you know prime candidates for 
uh, Shining Path uh, recruitment, given their conditions. But as I investigated the nature of livelihood change in the district over many decades leading up to the 1980s insurgency, uh, I came to realize that Kispiakta had actually prevailed in the decades-long land struggle uh, in among district communities for controlling contested high-altitude grazing lands in the area. And if you look at this um, topo map that I created, you can see um, there's yellow or uh, orangey crosshatch areas. Those are the areas that I was able to map where there were uh, long-term fights over who controlled the land. And the, the black outline line is the current boundaries of the community of Kispiactus sitting within the district boundaries outlined in red. Um, you can see that, uh, and this is a map that, that was consolidated after the final agreements for control of the land were settled. Kispiacta won many of those uh, conflicts and was able to actually control most of the contested land in the high altitude zones. So I increasingly wondered why the winners of these struggles for land, land struggles that have been going on for centuries, why they would have risked uh, that newly found control uh, to support the Shining Path's revolutionary goals. Uh, why would the community and, and members have, have put all of that at jeopardy? To me, Kispiakta seemed less likely to be strong supporters of the Shining Path in light of their general uh, success in the intercommunity conflicts in the district for control of those disputed land and water resources. But their disproportionate suffering in the district compared to other communities um, led me to revise my research question and push the study in a different direction. In an interview with a Kispiaktino survivor of a 1993 government massacre, um, really pushed me to wonder instead whether the nature of the violence that took place during the Civil War in 1982-83 uh, and afterward in this district was really a function of the struggles over the available resources, the key resources in this district. Um, the massacre survivor told me that he was uh, captured by the Peruvian military in early 1983, along with 14 other residents of Kispiakta by a combined group of Peruvian military counterinsurgency soldiers and a group of about 100 villagers from neighboring communities, communities that always had been uh, uh, competitors with Kispiakta for land, community of Chusci and other associated affiliated communities. Um, these locals not only helped to identify who they said were Shining Path sympathizers, they also rampaged uh, through uh, Kispiaktino homes, looting, uh, destroying the homes. Uh, and he was bundled up with these other 14 uh, captives taken to a nearby military base. And then uh, after being tortured for several days and questioned about Shining Path uh, sympathies, they took him out one day and told him to dig a pit with his other 14 captives. He kind of realized what was happening. It was in the middle of the night, and when his cap his captors weren't looking, he decided to throw himself off of a cliff. Uh, and he, while well, meanwhile, while his captors rained down machine gun fire around him. Luckily, miraculously, he survived. Uh, they didn't find him. He made his way back to his home community. Uh, he heard his fellow captives being executed, and he was able to tell the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission where the massacre site was, and they were later, later able to exhume those bodies, and his testimony is on the record. So from that and other data that I was getting in my field research, I really started to wonder whether the dynamics of violence in the district, both before and especially in the early years of the Civil War, violence which overwhelmingly fell on Kispiakta was influenced by the impact of pressures on renewable resources like land and water. Uh, and I wondered whether long-term changes in resource endowments really could help us understand why one community suffered so much in that civil war. And so that question really began to drive my research in this particular case. Now, um, the study was initially grounded on research findings on revolutions, on peasant revolts, on environment conflict linkages, and on uh, empirical research on rural revolts in Peru. Um, and this work really suggested uh, important hypotheses that framed my research. 
First, there was research on the causes of peasant rebellions and civil wars that stressed the role, the complex role of grievances and changes in opportunity structure as really key to explaining these kinds of events. Uh, environment conflict research um, suggests that environmental scarcities could influence the formation of grievances and impact opportunity structures in society and also help cause violent conflict. That work was also something that I used in my work. And empirical research on rural revolts in Peru in the 1960s and 70s suggested that political economic change and market and the impact of market penetration into remote regions that were just beginning to, uh, to enter uh, capitalist markets impacted both grievance formation and possibly opportunity structures for violent conflict. And in fact, very few scholars had actually done long-term field studies of these kinds of linkages. So it was another argument for why this was something uh, worthy to do. And from this uh, collected research, the research question during my study was really whether pressure on livelihood resources impacted subsistence security in the district of Chushchi and helped to cause rural violence and rural revolts in the district. Now, I used a mixed method and case study research design for my uh, work in Peru. I did more than 60 ethnographic uh, field interviews with district residents, um, almost all of them over 70 years of age. Uh, the oldest was 99 years of age in order to try to reconstruct long-term patterns of agricultural change and resource use in the district. Um, I also conducted a variety of archival research in Lima and Lamanga and in the district, uh, examining church records, for example, of, of baptisms as a proxy for um, birth and death records. And I conducted uh, qualitative um, uh, scientific uh, field research of the impacts of pressure on land resources, uh, 15 different measures of various forms of land degradation in Kispiak in order to try to quantify the local impacts of pressure on land resources. And then finally, I developed a household livelihood framework for local environment conflict researches, research in order to try to make sense of what I was seeing uh, and uh, to try to help make sense of the story. And that framework provides a lens that I use to judge and assess the trends that I was reconstructing over time in the district. Um, now, there are a few important historical trends that I wanted to outline briefly. Uh, it's a very big, long empirical study, but there are a couple of things that I think it's important to emphasize. Uh, first of all, traditionally, before the Spanish invaded the highlands of Peru, peasants, uh, small-scale farmers, lived a very dispersed uh, livelihood. They inhabited uh, in small, very small settlements, the whole area of what is now the district. Uh, but soon after Spanish colonialism, uh, as part of the uh, reforms that were instituted um, in the middle uh, 1500s, the uh, Spanish forced the dispersed indigenous peoples to concentrate into central towns organized on a Spanish town model. And they did that to be able to better control them and exploit them, but also to proselytize and convert them to Catholicism. Uh, very, so all of the, uh, the spread out communities were actually forcibly uh, taken and, and, and new communities were created in the south of the district, those town centers of Chuschi and Kispiakta that I told you about. And very few people ever lived again in the highlands. Uh, there were some uh, small herding communities temporary herding houses that were set up where people would go and take care of the animals. But uh, the bulk of people's livelihoods were then focused in that, the green areas in the south of the district where they focused mostly on, on uh, small scale subsistence agriculture. And instead in the uh, far north of the district, the best grazing lands were actually taken over by a series of, and by a series of small haciendas or plantations uh, set up by the Spanish where uh, herds were created for their benefit uh, on lands that were uh, that were you know would have been com traditional community grazing lands. Now uh, that began to change in the mid 1800s, about 20 or 30 years after Peru achieved its independence. Um, the the plantation economy for small marginal haciendas uh, went into freefall and declined in that area of Peru, 
And that opened up an opportunity for some of the communities actually to buy back some of the highland grazing lands that have been stolen from them. Uh, Kispiakta, uh, remarkably, uh, managed to purchase that area in Crosshatch uh, that you see there. Uh, and that land had always been considered as Kispiakta land by the residents of the community, but it was also considered by uh, the, the patrimony of land by neighboring communities who claimed the same land. Uh, but Kispiakta was able to buy it and had legal title um, over this area. And in the early part of the 20th century, especially by the mid 20th century, uh, increasing pressures on cultivated land in the southern part of the district where people had been by that time working for several centuries uh, and increasing population growth, partly stimulated by the epidemiological transition in the late 1800s and the early 20th century, meant that land was increasingly becoming scarce for, um, for peasants in the southern part of the district. They began to look for opportunities in other parts of the district to settle. And also by that time, um, agricultural, uh, especially livestock markets in Peru, began to expand and that increased the incentive for people to try to shift their settlement patterns to the livestock areas where they would raise uh, cattle or uh, other animals for the uh, market. So that stimulated a range of people settling informally in those high altitude contested zones where boundaries had never really been well established, where uh, control was contested by different communities. That led to a series of conflicts in the 1960s and 70s uh, as clashes over uh, control of these increasingly settled zones uh, really intensified and became more violent. Several people were killed in the 1960s and the violence became particularly bad in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But just as the Shining Path was starting to become much more active in the region. Uh, as I said, Kispiakta eventually won control of most of, most of those uh, contested highland grazing areas. Now, um, I want to share with you the empirical findings from my research and, and talk about some of the theoretical findings for the last part of my talk. Now, I think that for the first time, this study geographically maps settlement and land conflicts over the past few hundred years in the district, and it really enables us to see where communities conflicted over land and how uh, local internal migration worsened this conflict uh, and how Kispiakta eventually won most of these conflicts. And the mapping illustrates that the disputed lands uh, which were, had earlier been taken by Spanish elites in the valuable lower elevation zones of that of the northern part of the district, um, and especially nearby uh, high altitude water sources, were the were the areas that were the most um, fought over and most disputed. Um, and this study also, for the first time, highlights uh, it, it provides the first account of a peace settlement that actually settled this land conflict in 19, late 1982 between Kispiakta and Chusci uh, and settled what had been you know, one of the most famous land conflicts in Peru. Uh, and it was a settlement negotiated by the Kispiakta president Emilio Nunez Conde, who you see on the left, and by the Chusci president Marcelino Roja Callawa, who you see on the right, um, who were instrumental in negotiating this agreement and settling this conflict uh, and finalizing it just before the Shining Path actually drove out all uh, police and government representatives from the district of Chusci in late 1981, early 1982. Um, understanding the pro uh, these processes uh, that I've outlined, I think, really helps us to better understand why Kispiakta suffered to a greater extent from the Peruvian Army's counterinsurgency campaign in early 1883 as you saw from the casualty figures that I pointed out earlier. Um, and I think it's clear that this puzzle that I proposed at the beginning of my talk can't be explained um, without looking at uh, the land conflict and perhaps the revenge that some community members from rival communities decided to take out on, on Kispiakta because of their successes. Uh, and the outcome, of course, was a very disproportionate um, impact on the community of Kispiakta. Uh, 
uh, deadly uh, consequences. Now, let me turn to my theoretical findings and offer some, some comments on what I think this research actually tells us. First, I think there are actually really big divisions in environment conflict research uh, between different types of research, with a lot of the more recent research focusing on quantitative studies uh, of climate conflict linkages or environment conflict linkages. And I think that qualitative research has been marginalized in the field. And I think this work actually shows the benefit of qualitative field work uh, because using a very detailed process tracing methodology allowed me to sort of understand the long temporal scope of what I was seeing in this district and better appreciate the complex causation that was at the heart of, of the story here. Um, this study illustrates that the conflict impacts of resource capture or rent seeking or land dispossession as it's variously called uh, in the literature helped to stimulate conflict centuries after that original land capture had actually taken place. Uh, colonial resource capture by the Spanish and mestizo elites of those high altitude grazing zones um, didn't actually stimulate a lot of violent conflict until well into the 20th century between the communities in the district. Uh, the original resource capture, um, which might be expected to play a role in conflict generation at the time of the dispossession with the colonial masters, instead really played a role in helping to condition the violence at the end of the 20th century. Um, the long temporal scope of this study helped to reveal empirical deficiencies as well in existing scholarly accounts of why the conflict happened in the district. I won't go into that in too much detail, uh, but I'm happy to answer more questions about that in the discussion. And I think the case also avoids what's called the streetlight effect, uh, which has been a source of a lot of deba debate in the climate conflict research that's been done to date. And that's the problem that most of the research that's been done in climate conflict research has been biased towards areas where English or French speaking researchers have easy access. But the indigenous Andean highlands that I studied have actually seen very little uh, research on environment conflict linkages. And Latin America as a whole is still um, heavily underrepresented uh, in climate change, violent conflict research to date. As well, I think this case also demonstrates that household adaptation to environmental change, including responses to emerging slow onset climate change impacts, had social conflict implications. Human pressures on the environment and on livelihood resources combined with other political, economic, and social factors to aggravate group conflict between communities in the district of Chuschi in the decades leading to the Shining Paths insurgency. And this finding, I think, speaks to two key issues raised in recent reviews of climate conflict research. Excuse me. First, the Chuschi uh, case shows that we can't ignore the impact of supply and demand uh, of resources uh, that people rely upon for their well being. And we can't uh, to only focus on political economic inequality impacts uh, to explain the causes of violent conflict in these kinds of cases. And that's something a lot of political ecologists have argued or criticized uh, this kind of research for the past 20 years. And I think that that um, criticism is a bit misguided. Um, among the smallholder peasants that I studied in Peru, various factors impacted the supply of available resources and strained household livelihoods, um, impacting crop yields over time, uh, as this corn yield plot shows, where I, I show through my interviews and through other qualitative research, how yields had declined over time, uh, over decades, as uh, increasing pressures on the local resource base had uh, had developed throughout the 20th century. Um, a variety of different factors were impacting on local crop yields and livelihoods, factors such as erosion or misguided use of silviculture or green revolution technology, um, the disrupted and unreliable water availability uh, that was increasingly as the 20th century advanced partly a function of climate changes in the area. Um, climate change was impacting cultivator livelihoods in ways that partly led 
peasants to make livelihood adaptations. Crop cultivation zones were actually uh, expanding to higher elevation zones uh, as areas warmed while agriculture became increasingly more difficult in the low uh, altitude zones near the Rio Pampas. Uh, as heat became more intense and as uh, irrigation was uh, either unavailable or, or not, or they relied on rain-fed agriculture. Um, so climate change was one small factor, uh, well, small, it was one factor, I won't say it was a small factor, it was one factor among many uh, in this area that helped uh, to put stress on, fam on families' uh, ability to make a living in the lower zone and increase the attractiveness of settling the high altitude cultivated zones uh, where, where um, grazing and uh, livestock opportunities were more abundant. I also think that um, the political ecologists are wrong in, in, in um, not necessarily wrong, but I think that demand impacts on resource availability can't be ignored, particularly in societies that are in the midst of demographic transitions, as Peru was in the mid to uh, early to mid 20th century. Many political ecologists have heavily criticized any focus on the impact of population growth as simplistic neo-Malthusianism. But I think that this is wrong, and I think that my findings speak to other areas of the planet today, like in Africa or South Asia, that are still in the midst of a demographic transition. Growing demand for limited arable land endowments resulted in extensification of production, clearing hillsides to bring every available parcel into production, Inheritance practices that split a family's land among all the children gradually reduced arable land endowments for most households over decades. Protective land management practices like crop rotation and foul fallowing were increasingly abandoned uh, in, in the communities. And I was able to demonstrate this in my research in order to maximize production of increasingly smaller land endowments and take advantage of new commodity production opportunities. Um, household survival depended on these adaptations among peasants in the district. And I think many countries uh, in the developing world are still many years away from completing the demographic transition. And these increasing demand pressures will continue to influence households uh, and, and in important ways. And I don't think that this is I don't think that this is neo-Malthusian. I don't neo-Malthusianism. I don't think I'm throwing my hat in that corner. There's nothing preordained or set in stone about the impacts of population shifts. Governments and technology can mediate these impacts, but, in the, but if the pressures and the demands created by a growing population aren't well managed, they have potentially negative impacts on people's livelihoods and force people to adapt in some way. And I think that my story shows this. Supply and demand impacts on resource endowments in the southern cultivated zone of the district, particularly for the community of Kispiakta, stressed household livelihoods by reducing crop yields and crop quality in those areas. And the households responded, like farmers have always responded. They adjusted their livelihood activities and they sought out new opportunities, you know, migrating for. Uh, off-farm wages, for example, engaging in small-scale commodity production and taking advantage of the newly dynamic livestock markets to settle in those high-altitude zones of the district, uh, areas that just also happen to be uh, places that were long contested between communities in the area since they had been sort of captured by the Spanish elites. So if we only study the impacts of political economic factors or inequality, I think we're probably missing important elements of the story to explain why households made the livelihood decisions that they do. And I think this may end up explaining away important pressures on the environment or even uh, pressures from climate change. Um, the second key finding is that these pressures on livelihoods worsened group conflict in the district. 
Um, household adaptations to supply and demand pressures and the opportunity to settle in those contested grazing areas in the higher zones of the district led many residents of Kispiak and Chuschi to migrate from those old settled zones in the south of the district. And that internal migration and competition between communities for control of those former hacienda lands increased social segmentation uh, between the communities. It enhanced uh, negative othering between Kispiak and Chuschi, uh, and I think it, it worsened group divisions overall in the district among the communities and among the associated hamlets. Uh, and I think that's an important story that helps us to understand precisely how human pressure in the environment actually worsened group conflict, and that set the stage for the violent conflict that we saw in the 1960s 1970s and the consequences in the early 1980s. The third theoretical contribution that I make argues that um, research in the district shows that uh, slow onset environmental change helps to shape structures and processes rather than trigger violent conflict. And this is something that has been a, a big issue in a lot of the climate research as well. People talk about climate change triggering violent conflict. Uh, but I think that when we're talking about slow onset human environmental pressures, I think we need to change our focus a little bit. Supply, demand, and long-term negative distributional impacts on household resource endowments are causally significant, I think, as deep structural factors. They alter causal pathways. They impact constraints and opportunities on households uh, when you're dealing with these kinds of slow onset changes over years or decades or even centuries. They operate as root causes uh, and dynamic pressures. Uh, and I think they're, they're analogous to the movement of tectonic plates, uh, an analogy that Homer Dixon uses in his own research. I think he's correct there, uh, that these are you know, long-term structural impacts on the well-being of people. But they're not static root causes because scarcities and human pressures on, on resources change over time, altering household impacts. So I think that this study shows that slow onset impacts don't act like triggers. Instead, in this case, national or regional political policy changes, I found, uh, actually served as the triggers for a lot of the conflict in this particular case. Um, every regional or national political or policy change around resource control in this area of Peru going back to the mid 1800s triggered some kind of a community response uh, around resources and helped to stimulate conflict uh, between the communities or between uh, hacienda elites in the area. These policies I found were the triggers for violent conflict, not the human uh, pressure on the local resources. And I think that's, an important finding that speaks to, to our work on climate change and violent conflict research today, uh, where the field hasn't really, I think, come to grips with the difference between slow onset and sudden onset uh, changes from climate change. Um, fourth, I think that the research really shows that changing resource pressures and their availability combined with other factors to condition the patterns of violence during the Civil War against the Shining Path, rather than contributing to violent conflict onset. Again, this is something that contributes to, debate, to debates in the field where much of the research has really been focused on whether or not human pressure on the environment actually helps to cause violent conflicts in the first place. But very little work has actually been done to try to explore whether the dynamics of violence in a war is actually impacted uh, by human pressure on the environment. And I think that my research shows how these kinds of impacts can influence the process and direction of violence in civil wars, the nature of violence in the conflict, who was or who wasn't victimized. And I think that's kind of new, and it, it tends to support some of the work of civil war scholars like Stathis Kalivas, uh, who's written a very good book on the logic of violence in civil war. I think conflict onset as a focus for a lot of this research may be probably over overrepresented as a focus of a lot of the research. Uh, 
uh, compared to research that seeks to explain the worsening, or the aggravating of these kinds of violent conflicts, looking for the particular logics of violence in civil wars. And finally, uh, my last and fifth contribution is that I think my research shows that there's no linear pathways between impacts of uh, environmental change or human pressure on the environment and the social effects. Uh, and I think that the livelihood framework that I developed really shows this. Um, the household livelihood framework dispels notions of linear pathways between human pressure on the environment, social effects, and violent conflict, that there's going to be necessarily a straight line direct impact from humanity's pressure on the environment to violent conflict. Uh, this is something that the earlier generations of environment conflict research were heavily criticized. Um, part of the problem is the level of analysis that a lot of that research used. The state level of analysis in much of that first generation of research ignores that households mediate the impact of scarcities and human pressure in the environment, depending on a whole variety of factors that are um, inherent in a household's assets and capabilities. And the linkages and how they adapt and respond are never direct uh, or clear, but are complex. Uh, and in fact, I think we could say that households use complex adaptive coping responses and adaptive processes to try to make, uh, to try to survive in, in the context of dynamic environments. And, and my approach, I think, helps to model this a little more accurately. Um, and I think that this framework uh, helps us see more clearly some of the uh, some of the ways in which human pressure plays out, uh, but also the under, I think, underappreciated adaptive capacity of households to respond to local local environmental pressures or even distant uh, economic environmental pressures. Now, there are problems with the household livelihood framework. It's very difficult to scale it up. It's hard to use it. The data requirements are tremendous. There's no way that I could gather data on every household that I studied and try to scale this up even to one community in the district. The data requirements are just tremendous. Instead, I used it as a sort of heuristic tool to help make sense of what I was seeing. It's possible that you know, as we get better data in the future on household activities and assets and capabilities, we might be able to use machine learning uh, and AI technology to better model some of these processes. But um, that's, that's uh, for another research project beyond what I was doing in this particular case. <laughs> so just to sum up uh, what I was seeing uh, in this particular case was how human environmental change pressures impacted local group, group conflict and the logic of violence that was taking place during the Shining Path insurgency in the district. And that was a very different focus, a very different question that I was answering compared to when I initially started this project. Thank you. Thank you.